Good evening, folks, and welcome back to our reading of Pride and Prejudice. Tonight, we'll be reading Chapter 16. Previously, we have met Mr. Wickham, and he was, of course, invited over to their uncle's house. The Bennett sisters, that is, their uncle. And we will be picking up from there. So, Chapter 16, without further ado. As no objection was made to the young people's engagement with their aunt, and all Mr. Collins' scruples of leaving Mr. and Mrs. Bennet for a single evening during his visit were most steadily resisted. The coach conveyed him and his five cousins at a suitable hour to marry him, and the girls had the pleasure of hearing, as they entered the drawing room, that Mr. Wickham had accepted their uncle's invitation, and was then in the house. When this information was given, and they had all taken their seats, Mr. Collins was at leisure to look around him and admire, and he was so much struck with the size and furniture of the apartment that he declared he might have almost supposed himself in the small summer breakfast parlor at the Rosings, a comparison that did not at first convey much gratification. But when Mr. Phillips understood from him what Rosings was, and who was its proprietor, when she listened to the description of the only one of Lady Catherine's drawing rooms, and found that the chimney piece alone had a cost of eight thousand pounds, good golly. So I don't know if you guys remember this, but Darcy had, what, 10,000 pounds? I think Bingham had like, or Bingley had like 6,000? And if I remember correctly, 10,000 was at least 1.5 million. And that was not accounting for purchasing power. I think it was closer to 15, 16 mil. So, I mean, that that is like at least a $800,000 to a million plus <laughs> chimney piece. So, uh, yeah. Good for them. And found that the chimney piece alone had cost 8,000 pounds. She felt all the force of the compliment, and would hardly have resented a comparison with the housekeeper's room. In describing her all the grandeur of Lady Catherine in her mansion, with occasional digressions in praise of his own humble abode, and the improvements of it, it was receiving, he was happily employed until the gentleman joined them. Gracious, the small talk. I, I know a lot of people enjoy small talk. Um, I do not. I would die. This is why I enjoy Darcy quite a bit, because he also does not appear to enjoy it. Anyway, in the improvements it was receiving, he was happily employed until the gentleman joined them, and he found in Mr. Phil Mrs. Phillips a very attentive listener, whose opinion of his consequence increased with what she heard, and who was resolving to retail it, yeah, to retail it, among all her neighbors as soon as she could. To the girls, who could not listen to their cousin, and who had nothing to do but wish for an instrument, and examine their own indifferent imitations of china over the mantelpiece, the interval of waiting appeared very long. It was over at last, however. The gentleman did approach, and when Mr. Wickham walked into the room, Elizabeth felt that she had neither been seeing him before, nor thinking of him since, with the smallest degree of unreasonable admiration. The officers of the Shire were, in general, very credible, gentlemanlike set, and the best of them were at the present party. But Mr. Wickham was as far beyond, beyond them, all in person, countenance, air, and walk, as they were superior to the broad-faced, stuffy Uncle Phillips, breathing a port wine, who followed them into the room. Oh, right, as in he opened it to breathe, not, like, downing it. Which, also, great mental image, but... Mr. Wickham was the happy man towards whom almost every female eye was turned, and Elizabeth the happy woman by whom he finally had seated himself, and the agreeable manner in which he immediately fell into conversation, though it was only on its being a wet night, and on the probability of a rainy season, made her feel that the commoner made her feel that the commonest, dullest, most threadbare topic might be rendered interesting by the skill of the speaker. With such rivals for the notice of the fair, as Mr. Wickham and the officers, Mr. Collins seemed likely to sink into insignificance. To the young ladies, he was certainly nothing, but he had still at intervals a kind listener in Mrs. Phillips, and was, by her watchfulness, most abundantly supplied with coffee and muffin. Because if all else fails and the party sucks, hopefully the food's good. When the card tables were placed, he had an opportunity of obliging her in return, by sitting down to whist. I know little of the game at present, said he, but I should be glad to improve myself for the situation of life. And Mrs. Phillips was very thankful for his compliance, but could not wait for his reason. Mr. Wickham did not play at whist, and with ready delight he was received at the other table between Elizabeth and Lydia. At first there seemed danger of Lydia's engrossing him entirely, for she was a most determined talker. But likewise, being extremely fond of lottery tickets, she soon grew too much interested in the game, too eager in making bets and exclaiming after prizes, to have the attention for anyone in particular. Allowing for the common demands of the game, Mr. Wickham was therefore at leisure to talk to Elizabeth, and she was very willing to hear him, though what she chiefly wished to hear she could not hope to be told, the history of his acquaintance with Mr. Darcy. 
And if you remember correctly, Darcy uh, darkened profoundly when Wickham was introduced. She dared not even mention the gentleman. Her curiosity, however, was unexpectedly relieved. Mr. Wickham being, began the subject himself. He inquired how far Netherfield was from Meryton, and after receiving her answer, asked in a hesitating manner how long Mr. Darcy had been staying there. "'About a month,' said Elizabeth, and then, unwilling to let the subject drop, added, "'He is a man of very large property in Derbyshire, I understand.' "'Yes,' replied Wickham. "'His estate there is a noble one. A clear ten thousand pounds per annum. "'You could not have met with a person more capable of giving you certain information on that head than myself, "'for I have been connected with his family in a particular manner from my infancy.' Elizabeth could not help but look surprised. Oops, here we go. You may well be surprised, Miss Bennet, at such an assertion, after seeing, as you probably might, the very cold manner of our meeting yesterday. Are you much acquainted with Mr. Darcy? As much as I ever wished to be, cried Elizabeth warmly. I have spent four days in the same house with him, and I think him very disagreeable. I have no right to give my opinion, said Wickham, as to his being agreeable or otherwise. I am not qualified to form one. I have known him too long and too well to be a fair judge. It is impossible for me to be impartial, but I believe your opinion of him would in general astonish, and perhaps you would not express it quite so strongly anywhere else. Here you are in your own family. Upon my word, I say no more here than I might say in any house in the neighborhood except Netherfield. He is not at all liked in Hertfordshire. Everyone is disgusted with his pride. You will not find him more favorably spoken of by anyone. I cannot pretend to be sorry, said Wickham, after a short interruption, that he or any man should not be estimated beyond their deserts. But with him, I believe it does not happen often. The world is blinded by his fortune and consequence, or frightened by his high and imposing manners, and sees him only as he chooses to be seen. I should take him, even on my slight acquaintance, to be an ill-tempered man, Wickham said, shaking his head. I wonder, said he, at the next opportunity of speaking, whether he is likely to be in this country much longer. I do not at all know, but I have heard nothing of his going away while I was at Netherfield. I hope your plans are in favor of the, of the Shire, will not be affected by his being in the neighborhood. Oh, no. It is not for me to be driven away by Mr. Darcy. If he wishes to avoid seeing me, he must go. We are not on friendly terms, and it always gives me pain to meet him. But I have no reason for avoiding him, but what I might proclaim to all the world, a sense of very great ill usage, and painful regrets at his being what he is. His father, Miss Bennet, the late Mr. Darcy, was one of the best men that had ever breathed, and the truest friend I ever had. And I can never be in company with this Mr. Darcy without being grieved by the soul of a thousand tender recollections. His behavior to myself has been scandalous, but I verily believe I could forgive him anything and everything, rather than disappointing his hopes and disgracing the memory of his father. Elizabeth found the interest of the subject in Greece and listened with all her heart, but the delicacy of it prevented her from inquiring further. Mr. Wickham began to speak on more general topics, Meryton, the neighborhood, the society, appearing highly pleased with all that he had yet seen, and speaking of the latest especially, with gentle but intelligible gallantry. It was in the prospect of constant society, and good society, he added, which was my chief instrument to enter the Shire. I knew it to be a most respectable, agreeable corps, and my friend Danny tempted me further by his account of their present quarters, and the very great attentions and excellent acquaintance Merriton had procured from. Society, I own, is necessary to me. I have been a disappointed man, and my spirits will not bear solitude. I must have employment in society. A military life is not what I intended for, but circumstances have now made it eligible. The church ought to have been my profession, I was brought up for the church, and I should have at this time been in possession of a most valuable living, had it pleased the gentleman we are speaking of now. Indeed. Yes. The late Mr. Darcy bequeathed me the next presentation of his best living as a gift. He was my godfather, and excessively attached to me. I cannot do justice to his kindness. He was meant to provide for me amply, and though he had done it, but when the living fell, it was given elsewhere. Good heavens, cried Elizabeth. How could, he, how could that be? How could his will be disregarded? Why did you not seek legal redress? There was just such an informality in the terms of this bequest as to give me no hope from law. A man of honor could have doubt not doubted the intention, but Mr. Jarcy chose to doubt it, or to treat it as merely conditional recommendation, and to assert that I had forfeited all claim to it by extravagance, imprudence, and, in short, anything or nothing. Certain as it is that the living became vacant only two years ago, exactly as I was age of age to hold it, and it was given to another man, and no less certain it is and no less certain is it that I cannot accuse myself of having really done anything to deserve to lose it. I have a warm, unregarded temper, and I may perhaps have been sometimes spoken my opinions of him, and to him, too freely. I can recall nothing worse. But the fact is that we are very different sorts of men, and that he hates me. <laughs> we all have those people where it doesn't matter what you do. 
the difference in opinion will always be disagreeable, if polite. Although I've got a feeling Wickham is being, well, subtly impolite, and I believe he has an agenda. We shall see. That is quite shocking. He deserves to be publicly disgraced. Some time or other he will be, but it shall not be done by me. Till I can forget his father, I can never defy or expose him. Elizabeth honored him for such feelings, and thought him handsomer than she had ever than <clears throat> and found him handsomer than ever as he had expressed them. But what, said she after a pause, can have been his motive? What could have introduced him, induced him to behave so cruelly? <sighs> a thorough, determined dislike of me, a dislike which I cannot but attribute to some measure of jealousy. Had the late Mr. Darcy liked me less, his son might have borne with me better. But his father's uncommon attachment to me irritated him, I believe, very early in life. He had not a temper to bear the sort of competition in which we stood, the sort of preference which was often given to me. Hmm. I had not thought Mr. Darcy so bad as this. Though I have never liked him, I had not thought so very ill of him. I had supposed him of being despising his fellow creatures in general, but did not suspect him of descending to such a malicious revenge, such injustice, such inhumanity as this. After a few minutes' reflection, however, she continued, I do remember his boasting one day at Netherfield of the implacability of his resentments, and of his having an unforgiving temper. His disposition must be dreadful. I will not trust myself on the subject, replied Wickham. I can hardly be just to him. <laughs> Gracious. This is what neurotypicals talk like. Elizabeth was again deep in thought, and after a time explained, to treat in such a manner the godson, the friend, the favorite of his father, she could have added, a young man, too, like you, whose very countenance may vouch for you being amiable, but she content contented herself with, and one, too, who had probably been his own companion from childhood, connected together, as I think you said, in the closest manner. We were born in the same parish, within the same park. The greatest part of our youth was passed together, inmates of the same house, sharing the same amusements, objects of the same parental care. My father began life in the profession of which your uncle, Mr. Phillips, appears to do so much credit to. But he gave up everything to be of use to the late Mr. Darcy, and devoted all of his time to the care of the Pemberley property who was most highly esteemed by Mr. Darcy, a most in intimate, confidential friend. Mr. Darcy often acknowledged himself to be under the greatest of obligations to my father's active superintendence, and when, immediately before my father's death, Mr. Darcy gave him a voluntary promise of providing for me. I convinced him... I am convinced that he felt as much as a debt of gratitude to him as of affection to myself. How strange, cried Elizabeth, how abominable. I wonder what the very pride of, th of this Mr. Darcy has not made him just to you. If from no better motive, then he should have not been too proud to be dishonest, for dishonesty I must call it. It is wonderful, replied Wickham, for almost all his actions may be traced to pride, and pride has often been his best friend. It has connected him nearer with virtue than any other feeling. But we are none of us consistent, and in his behavior to me there were stronger impulses even than the pride. Can such abominable pride as his ever have done him good? Yes. It has often led him to be liberal and generous, to give his money freely, to display hospitality, to assist his tenants and relieve the poor. Family pride, filial pride. For he is very proud of what his father was, has done this. Not to appear to disgrace his family, to degenerate them from popular qualities, or to lose the influence of the Pemberley House, is a powerful motive. He also has brotherly pride, with which some brotherly affection makes him a very kind and careful guardian of his sister, and you will hear him generally cried upon as the most attentive and best of brothers. What sort of girl is Miss Darcy? He shook his head. I wish I could call her amiable. It gives me pain to speak ill of a Darcy, but she is too much like her brother, very, very proud. As a child, she was affectionate and pleasing, and extremely fond of me, and I have devoted hours and hours to her amusement. Why do I get the feeling that it is Darcy's sister, that Wickham did something to Darcy's sister? We'll see if I'm correct. <laughs> Again, I have not read this since high school, and I do not remember any of it. So, let's continue. As a child, she was affectionate and pleasing and extremely fond of me, and I have devoted hours and hours to her amusement. But she is nothing to me now. She is a handsome girl, about 15 or 16, and I understand her highly accomplished. Since her father's death, her home has been London, where a lady lives with her and superintends her education. After many pauses and trials of other subjects, Elizabeth could not help but reverting once more to the first, saying... I am astonished in his intimacy with Mr. Bingley. How could Mr. Bingley, who seems good humor, and who seems to be good humor itself, and is, I really believe, truly amiable, be in friendship with such a man? How can they suit each other? Do you know Mr. Bingley? Not at all. He is a sweet-tempered, amiable, charming man. He cannot know what Mr. Darcy is. Probably not, but Mr. Darcy can please when he chooses. He does not want abilities. He can, he can be a conversable companion if he, companion if he thinks it worth his while. 
Among those who are all his equal in consequence, he is a very different man from what he is to the less prosperous. His pride never deserts him, but with the rich he is liberal-minded, just, sincere, rational, honorable, and perhaps agreeable, allowing something for fortune and figure. The whist party soon afterwards breaking up, the players gathered around the other table, and Mr. Collins took his station between his cousin Elizabeth and Mr. Phillips. The unusual inquiries as to his success were made by the latter. It had not been very great, he had lost at every point, but when Mrs. Phillips began to express her concern thereupon, he assured her with much earnest gravity that it was not of the least importance, and that he considered the money a mere trifle, and begged she would not make herself uneasy. I know very well, madam, said he, that when persons sit down to a card table, they must first take chance of these things, and happily, I am not in such circumstances as to have made five shillings at any object. There are undoubtedly many who could not say the same, but thanks to Lady Catherine de Beau, I am removed from the beyond the necessity of regarding little matters. Mr. Wickham's attention was caught, and after observing Mr. Collins for a few moments, he asked Elizabeth in a low voice whether her relation was very intimately acquainted with the family of the de Beaux. Lady Catherine de Beau, she replied, has given him... A has lately given him a living. I hardly know how Mr. Collins was first introduced to her notice, but he certainly has not known her long. You know, of course, that Lady Catherine de Beau and Lady Anne Darcy were sisters. Consequently, she is the aunt to the present Mr. Darcy. No, indeed I did not. I knew nothing at all of Lady Catherine's connections. I had never heard of her existence till the day before yesterday. Her daughter, Miss de Beau, will have a very large fortune, and it is believed that she and her cousin will unite the two estates. This information made Elizabeth smile, as the thought of poor Miss Bingley, as she thought of poor Miss Bingley, vain indeed must be all her attentions, vain and useless in her affections for his sister, and praise of herself, or pra her praise of himself, if he were already self-destined to another. Mr. Collins, said she, speaks highly of both Lady Catherine and her daughter, but from some particulars he has related of her ladyship, I suspect his gratitude misleads him, and that in spite of being his patroness, she is an arrogant, conceited woman. I believe her to be both in great degree, replied Wickham. I have not seen her for many years, but I very well remember that I never liked her, and that her manners were dictatorial and insolent. She has the reputation of being remarkably sensible and clever, but I rather believe she derives part of her abilities from her rank and fortune, and part from her authoritative manner, and the rest from the pride of her nephew, who chooses that everyone connected with him should have an understanding of the first class. Elizabeth allowed that he had given a very rational account of it, and they continued talking together with mutual satisfaction till supper put an end to the cards, and gave the rest of the ladies their share of Mr. Wickham's attentions. There could be no conversation in the noise of Mr. Mrs. Phillips's supper party, but his manners recommended him to everyone. Whatever he said, he said well, and whatever he did was done gracefully. Elizabeth went away with her head full of him. She could think of nothing but Mr. Wickham, and of what he had told her, all the way home, but there was no time for her even to mention his name as they went, for neither Lydia nor Mr. Collins was once silent. Lydia talked incessantly of lottery tickets, of the fish that she had lost, and the fish that she had won, and Mr. Collins, in describing the civility of Mr. and Mrs. Phillips, protesting that he did not in the least regard his losses at whist, enumerating all the dishes at supper, and repeatedly fearing that he crowded his cousins, had nothing more to say, sorry, had more to say than he could well manage before the carriage stopped at Longburn House. And we will go ahead and call it there for the evening. And those of you may have noticed that the mustache is less fun recently. And that is because my studio is very, very warm. And unfortunately, the wax begins to um, droop <laughs> in a most sad manner if I do any kind of long reading. So for the present summer of the reading, we will likely be, um, sadly, less stylish in our mustache. But anyway, folks, remember, never give up. Never surrender. Have a lovely evening. Sleep well, and we'll see you soon. And if you could, please remember to like and subscribe and comment to help me with the algorithm so we can spread these stories to other folks. Thank you, and good night.